Well, it's good to see each of you here this morning. Glad that we have this opportunity to worship, and we are getting ready to enter into another aspect of worship. And we just sang a song about Give Us the Bible. And in this period of worship, we show our respect and reverence to God by proclaiming his word. I hope to do my part by teaching the truth, and I hope you will hold me accountable to that by taking your Bibles out and following along as we look and examine uh, scripture this morning and learn the truths that God has revealed for us. Today I've chosen to talk about the subject of repentance and I've chosen this subject not because I've gotten to know some of you and feel like this is something you need to be doing but I chose this subject because we're studying the minor prophets and this is a theme that we see in the minor prophets over and over. And so I wanted to kind of look at those passages that we have uh, examined in our Bible class and uh, think about them as they relate to uh, repentance. But as we look at repentance, repentance is a subject that is essential to one's salvation. Jesus says in Luke 13 and verse 3, I, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And so there were some questions being asked of Jesus at this time about people who died because a tower fell on them or people who died because uh, they were used as human sacrifices to an idol. And the Lord is telling the people, don't worry about those things. What you need to worry about is making your life right. You need to repent or you're going to perish. And so he makes this something that is essential. We also see in Acts 17 and verse 30, Paul says, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Everybody is commanded to repent. There's not a person that doesn't need to repent. The Bible also teaches us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so repentance is necessary uh, to our overcoming that sin. But as we think about this command to repent, why would we do that? Why would we repent of our sins? And I think when you look at the next verse here, verse 31, it starts off with the word because. Why has God commanded all men everywhere to repent? Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given us assurance of this all by raising him from the dead. There are two things in that verse that I think Paul is telling us will lead us to want to keep the command of God to repent and the first thing is there is a day of judgment and this is going to lead us uh, to something we will discuss in a few moments about things associated with repentance but here Paul is using something that is going to happen in the future the judgment day as a motivating factor for us to repent of our sins the second thing that he talks about is the fact that uh, we look at Christ and his resurrection from the dead And we think about the death of Christ, and we remembered his death this morning in observing the Lord's Supper and the salvation that we have through him. But as confident as we are about Christ being raised from the dead, that's the same level of confidence we need to have about the day of judgment. If we truly believe Christ raised from the dead, and that was a fact, there is a day in which God is going to judge us. That is a fact. And so we need to repent. God has commanded all men everywhere to repent, to prepare for that day. And so let's think about repentance defined. What does the word repentance mean? Well, according to Strong's, uh, who defines words according to their original use in the Greek language, Strong defines repentance as to think differently or afterwards, to reconsider something morally or to feel compunction. And we think about Vine's expository dictionary of Old Testament, New Testament word. He says that repentance means to change one's mind or purpose. And so when we think about God commanding us to repent, what is God wanting us to do? He's wanting us to think differently. He he wants us to change the way we have thought about something to uh, think in a new way to change our mind or to change our purpose about some activity or some event. 
And I think when we look at uh, repentance to find a good illustration of these definitions is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9. Paul here is writing to the Christians of the church at Thessalonica. And he says, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. Now remember, when we thought about our definition of repentance we're talking about thinking differently we're talking about reconsidering something to change one's mind to change uh, one's perspective and we see that with the brethren here at Thessalonica first of all they turned from idols what made them turn from idols well they thought differently about that they changed their mind about that they reconsidered idolatry and what all that did well, why did they do that? Well, because Paul went to Thessalonica and he preached the gospel. They learned the truth. And so they changed their mind about uh, idols. But also as we look at repentance, not only did they change their mind about idols, but we see that they turned to God. And so uh, their repentance involved them turning from something and turning to something else changing their mind about one thing and then correcting that and thinking about uh, something else. And that's the idea of repentance. That's the definition that we need to have uh, in our thoughts. Now, again, we think about what accompanies repentance, and we talked a little bit about that in Acts 17 and verse 31. When we look at repentance, there are things that precede this changing of the mental thought. And one of the things that we see in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10 is that godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Godly sorrow leads one to think differently about something else. Godly sorrow will cause a person to reconsider uh, something they have been doing and change their mind about that. And so the Thessalonians, they learned about the wickedness of idolatry. They learned about the futility of idolatry, that it was worthless, it didn't do any good. And they changed their mind about that. Well, godly sorrow caused that. Godly sorrow today will cause a person to change their mind about sin. Maybe they see how terrible drunkenness is, or maybe they see how terrible sexual immorality is. And so they look at all the things that are associated with that, how God defines that as, as a sin, how that sin required Christ to come to this world and die upon the cross. That's godly sorrow. And godly sorrow will cause a person to change their way they think about uh, activities that they have participated in. We also see in the scriptures, in Romans 2 and verse 4, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Another thing that will help us change our mind about sin is God's goodness. And some of the goodness of God is mentioned right here in this verse. The riches of his goodness, God's forbearance with us, God's long-suffering with us. I mean, God could strike us dead the moment we choose to sin, but he doesn't. He's long-suffering. He doesn't want us to suffer from, from sin, so he gives us the opportunity to hear the truth. He gives us the opportunity to change the way we think. He gives us that opportunity to make corrections. That's his long-suffering, and Paul says this goodness of God encourages us to repent. It will motivate us to repent. But also we see in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 that Peter says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any uh, should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I talked about the fact that repentance is a theme of the prophets, not just the minor prophets, but the major prophets as well. And long-suffering is a part of that message of the prophets. All the prophets were sent to warn the people they needed to repent because of the judgment to come. That was the long-suffering of God to give them that opportunity, not just to go in and strike them down, not just to go in and punish them. He wanted them to make this correction. And we benefit from this same attribute of God today. God is long-suffering toward us so that we might come to repentance, 
so that we have opportunity to learn about things and change our mind and opinion about those things that are sinful and turn to God and do those things that are right, to do those things that are serving him. And so there are things that precede this uh, repentance, but there's also things that follow repentance. Once a person has been led to repent, once they have changed their mind and they have actually repented, things will follow that. And in Luke 3 and verse 8, John, who was the forerunner of Christ, says, Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And so when we look, John is saying, If you truly repent, then this is going to change your life. And the change is going to be seen in things that are produced in your life at that point. He calls it the fruits of repentance. Today, if someone truly repents and they know they need to change something, they make the decision to change it, if that is genuine, then you're going to see fruits of that decision. Again, thinking about the brethren at Thessalonica, they learned idolatry was wrong, but they didn't stop there. They knew they had to serve God. And so they turned from idolatry to serve the living God. Serving the living God was fruits of repentance. And so this helps us see that today, if we truly repent, this change is going to be demonstrated uh, in our lives as well. And so we want to look at some examples. Uh, these are uh, going to come mostly from the minor prophets uh, that we have been studying about repentance, about this idea of turning from sin and turning to God and, and serving him and uh, see some good illustrations and see some that uh, are not good. Uh, but hopefully this is all to help us, again, come to understand repentance in our lives uh, as well. When we think about repentance, as we've learned so far, we're talking about thinking differently, to reconsider, to change mind, or to change our purpose. And this, in a biblical sense, is used in reference to sin and as we think about that sin there are things that will motivate us to change we talked about godly sorrow we talked about the goodness of God and the long suffering of God and so that is going to be there to motivate us uh, to make that change from sin but we also talk about turning to God the fruits worthy of repentance and so as we look at these examples let's consider uh, what we can learn from them the first example that I want us to think about is in the book of Jonah, and it's the example of Nineveh, the city of Nineveh, uh, the capital of Assyria, and uh, these people are not descendants of Abraham, they are not Jews, they are very wicked people, and it's interesting that we can look to, to them and see an example of people who repented like they should. They had godly repentance, and as a result of that, uh, they were uh, able to uh, escape punishment from God. But as we think about Jonah, Jonah was instructed to go to Nineveh. If you look at Jonah chapter 1 and verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. And we know Jonah didn't want to do that. He flees and gets swallowed by a fish. And then he uh, turns and he goes and does what God said. Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh and preach because he knew these are my enemies. This is the nation that will destroy my nation. I don't want God to uh, relent from destroying them. I want them to be destroyed. And Jonah knew that if he went and uh, preached repentance to these people, and they repented that God would forgive them. He would not destroy them. So that's why Jonah wasn't uh, interested in doing what God commanded. But we notice that uh, after he is vomited out of the fish, he does do what God commands him to do. In chapter 3, he arises and goes to Nineveh. And he is instructed when he goes to Nineveh there in verse 3 to preach uh, the message that I tell you to preach. Jonah is not given the authority to change anything that God tells him to say. He has to say uh, what God uh, wants to be delivered. And so when we look at the message that Jonah preaches to them, I think going back to chapter 1, 
Uh, we can learn from verse 2, the people are wicked, uh, they are sinful, uh, God is crying out against them, uh, he's warning them about the uh, judgment that's going to come upon them uh, shortly, and uh, 40 days according to verse 4, they will be overthrown, uh, so their destruction is imminent. And so this is all of the message that Jonah is preaching, and if you look at verse 5, it says the people of Nineveh believe God. Now, that's better than Jonah. Jonah heard what God said, and he tried to flee and go to Tarshish. But the people of Nineveh, they looked at Jonah, and they listened to his message. They accepted that not as the message of a man. They accepted it as the message of God. And they said, we need to do something about this. We need to change the way we are living. We need to change the things that we are doing. So they wanted to turn from sin. And in fact, when you go down to verse 8 uh, here in Jonah chapter 3, you can see that that's what the people do. Uh, it says, let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. They had a mind change, a mindset change. They thought differently. They reconsidered. This evil, this wickedness that we've been doing, we need to stop. And so they make the decision that they need to turn from their evil way. And that's what we see repentance involves. This is what precedes repentance, is that you turn from the evil that you have been doing. But that's just uh, not enough. They also need to turn to God, and this is what we uh, again see that they do. When we go back to verse 5, you can see that the people proclaim to fast, they put uh, on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. And so they went through demonstrations of their actual sorrow for the sins that they were guilty of. And uh, they were showing signs that they had genuinely had a, a change of thought, a change of purpose in their lives. And in verse 10 there, chapter 3, it says that God saw their works. They turned to him from their evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he has said he would bring upon them, and he did not uh, do it. And so when God saw everything that they had done, he knew that it was genuine. They had genuinely repented, and God said, I'm not going to destroy you. You have been delivered from that destruction. This is an example of biblical repentance. This is an example of the type of repentance that is pleasing to God. And today... I think when we look at actual repentance, it's one of the most difficult commandments that a person can do. And sometimes we may think, well, being baptized is difficult because uh, a lot of people don't believe you have to be baptized to be saved. A lot of people who have genuinely repented don't question baptism. Once they get past repentance and they know, I need to get away from these sins and I need to turn to God, they will confess, they will be baptized for the remission of sins. But getting a person to the point where I have committed things that are sinful and against God and I need to stop that and not do it anymore, that's a difficult thing because people have to be uh, shown that they are doing things that uh, God displeases of. Maybe it's living in an unscriptural marriage. And repentance would mean correcting that. Maybe it's doing something that a person enjoys, like going out and playing golf and uh, drinking a six-pack of beer with your friends while you do that. Uh, the things that people need to repent of can be very difficult. And so when we look at the people of Nineveh, uh, it's an encouraging thing that here are people that did very wicked things. Uh, when they would go in to destroy a nation, uh, they would uh, kill babies in the womb of women who were expecting. They were very ruthless and, and cruel. They liked to shed blood, and God didn't approve of that. And so they repented of that, and it was genuine, and, and God forgave them. And I think when we look at Nineveh, that taught to encourage each of us today, because some may think, well, I couldn't change my life. I can't repent. I, I can't be forgiven by God. I don't care what you've done. It's not any more wicked than what the people of Nineveh did. 
And if God was willing to forgive them when they repented, God will forgive you when you repent as well. So this is an example, a good example of people who repent. Another example we want to consider is the example of Judah. And if you will, let's turn back to the prophet Joel. One of the things that you can associate with Joel is locusts. Locusts are eating everything. They're eating the crops that are ready to be harvested. They're eating the leaves on the plants. They're eating the plant itself. They're eating the plants that are about to come up. They are completely destroying. And so Joel is a prophet that's sent to the people to encourage the people that uh, they need to repent. In Joel chapter 1 and verse 15, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as destruction from the Almighty God. And so the people have been living uh, sinfully and wick- wickedly, and they need to repent. In chapter 2 and verse 1, blow the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. And so God's judgment is upon them. And so they have been sent a prophet, and the prophet's encouraging them to turn to God and escape this destruction. And so when we think about that, it revolves, involves repentance, thinking differently, reconsidering, changing the mind, changing the purpose. Did they uh, have godly sorrow? Did they consider the long-suffering of God? Uh, did they look at God's goodness? And did those things lead them to repentance? Well, I can't find anywhere in the prophet Joel that they did. I can't see any of that where they looked at a sin and regretted it, where they thought about their relationship with God and we're given a land flowing with milk and honey and it's not and it's been eaten by locusts. That should tell me I need to correct something. I don't see any passages like that. Uh, The people aren't changing their mindset But it is interesting when you look in Joel chapter 2 that we do see that the people have some idea of turning to God and repenting. If you notice Joel 2 and verse 12, it says, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. And we kind of have seen those things with the people of Nineveh, that they fasted and uh, they were in sorrow and sackcloth. But he tells them in verse 13, So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. As we think about them turning to God, they are told to rend their hearts and not your garments. And I think when you look at these instructions, this is the problem that Joel is identifying with the people, is that they are not sincere. When it comes to their sins and correcting it, they think, oh, well, we put on sackcloth and we tear it. That's repentance. That's the outward sign, and God will see that and will be forgiven. The problem is their heart's not involved. They weren't tearing their hearts. There's no godly sorrow. There's no thought in their mind, we need to stop doing this. We need to stop living wickedly. We need to stop living unrighteously and and avoiding the commandments of God none of that's there only thing is there is the outward appearance of repentance and as Joel is saying to the people this is not acceptable God isn't going to uh, relent from destroying you because of that Uh, they were still in danger of being destroyed at this time and so unlike Nineveh this is an example of what repentance is not Uh, Even though these are the descendants of Abraham, they aren't genuinely repenting. Another example that we want to look at, and we just talked about this this morning in the book of Hosea. Hosea was sent to primarily the northern kingdom of Israel. And Hosea is teaching the people about judgment to come. Uh, He is teaching them that uh, they need to genuinely Uh, repent Uh, when we look at Hosea uh, chapter 5 and verse 4 it says they did not direct their deeds toward turning to their God for the spirit of holotry is in their midst and they do not know the Lord so despite the prophets 
despite the messages the people don't know uh, the Lord. Now, obviously, if you ask them, is there a God, they would say, yes, there's the God of Abraham. He brought us out. They have that knowledge. To know the Lord means that they are keeping his will, that they are being obedient to him. And from that sense, they did not know the Lord. And uh, because of this, again, Joel is, is showing them that judgment is about to come. Now, that destruction uh, is coming, but it appears, if you look at chapter 5, that things have already happened. In verse 13, when Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound. Now, I don't know what that sickness is or the wound is, but those are things that cause the people to think about the way that they were living. Why is this happening to us? Uh, what caused this to happen? And as we talked about in class this morning, instead of turning to God, who could help them in this situation, what did they do there in verse 13? It says they sent to the king uh, Jerob, and yet, uh, yet he cannot uh, cure you nor heal you of your wound. And so they went to the Assyrians, who are going to ultimately destroy them for help uh, with this problem that they have. They did not turn uh, to God, as we noticed there in verse 4. And so uh, they have a problem uh, with their repentance. And when we get to Hosea chapter 6, we see that their repentance is typically just going through the motions. Okay, we have uh, a problem. We're being uh, suffering from this disease. We're suffering from this wound. If we repent, God will forgive us, and we can go back to the way that we want things to be. Notice chapter 6, in verse 1, it says, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us. After two days he will uh, revive us. On the third day he will raise us up, that we may live uh, in his sight. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and the former rain to the earth. What are they saying? Well, unlike them who are unfaithful to God, they're saying God is faithful. God is dependable. On the second day, he'll do this. On the third day, he'll do this. He's like the former rain. He's like the latter rains. It's just dependable. And if we just repent, we go through the motions, God is going to restore us and everything is going to be wonderful. But God is letting them know just going through the motions is not going to be enough. He tells them in verse 4, O Ephraim, what shall I do to you? O Judah, what shall I do to you? For your faithfulness is like the morning cloud, and like the early dew it goes away. When we look, the people are just temporarily serving God to get out of the situation that they are in and to get back to their life. Their repentance is only momentary at best. And I know people that are, are like that. A good visit to the doctor will bring them to the front of the congregation and confessing sins to find relief until that medical scare passes and then they go back to their unfaithfulness again. There are people that have that temporary return to God uh, in order to escape some unpleasant thing that's happening in their life or some fear that they have in their life at the time. And God's saying that's, that temporary return is not enough. That's not genuine repentance. I'm not going to be pleased with that. In verse 5 he says, Therefore I have hewn them by, my, by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And your judgments are like light that goes forth. So God's tried to teach the people the correct way to repent. And he says in verse 6, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. And I know sometimes people look at this passage and say, Well, it doesn't matter how you worship God. How you worship is not important. You can just worship God any way you want to. Uh, God is more concerned about mercy than he is how you worship. And so they use that to justify anything that they want to do and call it worship. That's not the point. When you look at verse 6, the, uh, the sacrifice uh, and the burnt offerings, where did those things come from? The commandments of God. So how can you say they aren't important? 
God commanded them to offer sacrifices. He commanded them to burnt, uh, burnt offerings. And if you want to go back to the book of Leviticus, it can be tedious. You have to do this. It has to be this animal, this age. It has to be offered this way, and this is what you do. I mean, God was very specific how those things had to be done. You can't say those things aren't important. But what we understand from this passage and looking at the people that we're talking about is that they did not have their heart in what they were doing. And so they could have had thousands and thousands of sacrifices and thousands and thousands of burnt offerings, but they had not turned to God with their heart yet. That was the problem. And that's what God is saying he wanted. I want your heart. I want your mercy. I want you to have a knowledge of me. And if you have those things, then your sacrifices and burnt offerings will be acceptable to me. But because they did not have their heart involved and they were just going through the motions and saying, hey, you know what? If we act like we're sorry for a little while on the second day and on the third day, God's going to revive us. When you have that type of attitude, God is not going to be pleased. This is not an example of repentance. Our repentance needs to be genuine. Does there need to be fruits of repentance? Certainly. But it needs to come from our hearts. It needs to be a permanent change that we're making in our lives. And then the last example that I want us to consider is from the New Testament. And it is the Christians at Corinth, the Corinthians. And we'll be... Uh, looking at a passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And uh, we referred to 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 earlier in our lesson that godly sorrow produces repentance. But we want to go back a few verses here uh, in chapter 7. Go back to verse 6. Paul says, Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the con consolation with which he was comforted in you when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. So to put these words in context, Paul had worked at the city of Corinth and had left. He had heard a report about things going on at that church, and so he wrote the first Corinthian letter that we are familiar with to address some of those issues. After they had received that letter, Paul sends Titus to work with the brethren at Corinth. Now Titus is coming back to Paul. So Paul's saying, I'm very encouraged to have Titus with me again. Not just to have him with me, but I'm encouraged because Titus talked about the way that you received him, and I'm so thankful that you received him the way that you did. And Titus let me know that the letter that I wrote to you, it may have upset you, but it upset you in a good way because they repented. They repented and they changed uh, concerning the things that Paul wrote to them. In verse 8, uh, Paul says, For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance, for you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. And so Paul talks about the things that precede repentance here. Paul had made them sorry with his letter. They had come to understand how terrible the things that they were doing were. To turn the Lord's Supper into a common meal, to divide over the use of spiritual gifts, to take one another to law, to have a member in the congregation openly practicing sexual immorality by taking his father's wife. Those things that Paul addressed made them sorry, and he was sorry that he had to do that. But Paul is thankful because when they were made sorry, they thought differently then. They reconsider things, they change their mind, they change their purpose. And so they had uh, uh, repented uh, as he instructed there. This had led them uh, to repentance. And as a result of them being led to repentance, we can see that uh, fruit was created. If you notice verse 10, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. 
not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. So they not only knew we need to stop doing these things, they knew they needed to turn to God. And verse 11 here is saying that's what they did. Look at what was produced by them having godly sorrow and repenting. Look how that changed their lives. Again, if you look at verse 11 there, for observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this uh, matter. Going back to that first letter and thinking how divided they were and the problems that they had in that congregation and to see Paul say these things about them is very commendable upon their part. And it's commendable because these people had genuinely repented. They had good godly sorrow about those sins and they wanted to turn and serve the Lord. And so they put forth that diligence. They wanted Paul, they wanted others to know that we're clear in this matter. The things that you charge us with, we're not guilty of those things anymore. We're living our lives in, uh, differently. They had indignation about those sins, about the things that they had done. They had fear, not necessarily fear of being terrified, but they had a fear of wanting to please Paul, who was an apostle uh, in the Lord's church. Maybe they had a fear about wanting to please God. They had a vehement desire to, to make these corrections. They completely con cleared themselves in this matter. And I would say to us today, that's an example that we need to follow. Because if there are sins in our life and we truly have godly sorrow for them and we repent, our lives are going to change. We will be just like them and we will want to follow the Lord to this degree. We will want people to know, hey, I don't do that anymore. I don't live that way. My, that was my former life. Now I'm a Christian. Now I serve the Lord. I'm clear in these matters. And you might look at your life and you may think, well, I'm not as diligent as I used to be. You know, I used to be very diligent. I'm not uh, as fearful as I used to be when it comes to pleasing the Lord. And I'm not as fearful as uh, what brethren think about me and whether they accept me or not. I'm going to do what I want to do. If those are things that are going on in your life, you may need to look at what Paul said to the Corinthians. You may need to have some godly sorrow. You may need to start thinking about sin and what sin does and how sin affects your life, how sin affects your relationship with God, how sin affects your relationship with your family and with other Christians, and you might need to repent. And if you genuinely repent then these things may come back to your life. You may have that diligence again. You may have that vehement desire. You may have that vindication. And so this morning, I hope this lesson will be encouraging to you regarding repentance. Do you need to repent today? As we have seen in our lesson, repentance means to think differently, to reconsider, to change the mind, to change our purpose. We're changing this because we're turning from sin uh, this term from sin which is produced by godly sorrow thinking about the goodness of God thinking about the long suffering of God and once we decide to repent we see that this changes our life and this change is seen in the fruits worthy of repentance if you're here this morning and you're not a person who has ever obeyed the gospel but you know you have sins in your life and you know this morning you want to turn away from those sins there are other things that you need to do besides repent. We talked a little bit about this earlier. You need to confess. In Matthew 10 and verse uh, 31 and 32 were read earlier. We need to make a confession with our mouth that we believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then to be forgiven of our sins, we need to be baptized to have those sins washed away. But if you're here this morning and you know you need to repent, we want to encourage you to do that. If you are a Christian and have already obeyed the gospel and you need to repent, 
You simply need to do what John says in 1 John chapter 1, and that is to confess your faults to God in prayer and seek forgiveness. And God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. If we can assist you in repenting this morning, we ask you to make that known as we stand and sing. Thank you for watching this video. We're glad that you have found our channel. And in fact, while you're here, we would encourage you to subscribe to the Jones Road Church of Christ channel. We have several videos already up, and we believe you'll find these to be true to God's Word, helpful to you in your journey toward God. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you.